I have a little bit more lecturing to do before noon, but first I'm going to finish up on what I alluded to before the coffee break, and that is, if I run Paraview in parallel, it, I'm going to show you how it distributes the data. We're going to take a few minutes to do this, and then we'll go back to the lecture. So in Paraview, <coughs> in the settings of the application, the general settings, I have a button here to enable MPI, and I'm going to use the default, which is two tasks for Paraview. I'll enable, I apply, I say OK. I quit, and I now reload my script. Exactly the same as before, the same syntax. Now you see that it's starting an MPI exec with two processors. But the magic of it is that my grid is still there. Everything is there, surface. Uh, yeah, look, it's pretty dark. Let me actually remove the wireframes. It's my data. You recognize it. Where's the parallelism in it? I'm going to show you. There's a field called VTK process ID. And I used it. I used two processes because it's the color of the flag of Ticino, blue and red. It just works. Anyway, Paraview by itself took the visualization pipeline and, say, and, I, and said, I have two servers. I'm just going to cut the grid in two. Very good. I'll go back to my settings uh, here. Let's pick a number. Let's say three, because we have a, a small grid. And I'm going to relaunch. How would you imagine that Paraview breaks this particular grid in three pieces? Do the mental exercise in your head. I restart, and then we'll see if you were right or wrong. Now, I restart. Oh, did I do apply? I hope so. Yes. MPI exec three. There's my grid. OK, are you ready? You've made your, your bet. This is it. OK? It's what Berlin explained earlier. Perhaps some of you had already gone to coffee. Paraview does a KD3 partitioning. What does it mean? It divides along the x direction once, two halves. Then it divides along the y direction once, the z direction, and then cyclically it will divide for um, as, as many MPI servers it has until the data has been reduced to fit on each server. Here we have three. So those three pieces, they seem, of, they seem very different, but they actually have more or less the same weight in terms of number of nodes. And we could, we could go exactly look at the indices, and we would see that they are equal. So this is processor 0, processor 1, processor 2. There. We'll do a lot more of that Friday when I teach the advanced Paraview and VTK stuff. But this is an avant-premiere, if you want, of Paraview. So that I don't forget, I'm going to turn the MPI off again. Apply, OK, and quit. And I'll go back to my lecture. All right. How did all of this happen? So there is the syntax I use to set up my grid. The Python programmable source has two fields for us to program. The first one is the request information. This is the first pass of the pipeline where we advertise what is available. We set the dimensions 31 cube. 
we set the global extent, the wall extent, to be 0, 30, 0, 30, etc. And then this is the magic that makes Paraview, that gives the possibility of, to Paraview to automatically make data partitions. We say the source is capable of producing sub-partitions. That's what this means. And then in the request for data, we, now, of course, if Paraview tells us, I'm going to decide on smaller pieces, I need to know what those smaller pieces are. I need to know the indices of those smaller pieces. So we have two different key to read in the execution phase. The first one is the global dimensions that we know is, go is going to be identical for all MPI processes. And then each local MPI rank will have access to the so-called update extent. It's its own private set of dimensions within the global domain. There. How do we program the Paraview programmable, the Python programmable source? We have three things to do. Define an output data set. So we have here a list in the graphical user interface. You get an object called programmable source, and you have a list of types, polydata, structured rectilinear, unstructured image data, multi-block, etc. And there's two more missing because this is a, a slide I have reused from a few years ago. There is now VTK molecule which is very great, I, I'm, I'm using that. And there is, what's missing? Uh, I think there is one more, anyway. You pick the type of output you desire. And by the way, the code you execute is executed on the server side, which really means the server side is aware of how many tasks are allocated for Paraview, how many pipelines, so to speak, are, are available. That Python code is NumPy-centric, so it knows all the, num the NumPy syntax and the transparent interchange between NumPy and VTK, right? And that's important. And we have to fill up the, the source code for those, at least the first one and the third one. The second one is advanced. I might have an example for it on Friday. This is really advanced uh, level. So back to my example. Uh, here I make it 11 cube to make it more visible. In the request information, I set the global extent, the spacing, the origin, and we've seen this already. When you practice the example, you need to do one simple thing. Go in the graphical user interface and change the dimensions and hit apply. And you can generate anything you want, any dimension you want. You can blow up the virtual machine if you, if you type a million cubes. <laughs> okay, don't. Don't blow up the machine. Anyway, that will be the, no, the number to change. Everything else will be automatically recomputed by the pipeline. <clears throat> On the execution pass, again, I get my, my global extent. I get my local extent. And then I generate the data with my local extent. So this is actually the command used. Output, by the way, is a predefined name. So if you have selected that you want to do, a v you want to generate a VTK polydata, output will be of type VTK polydata. If you switch that to rectilinear grid, output will be a rectilinear grid already. So the, the those those keywords are predefined based on the type you select. And then I append my data array and I give it a variable name. 
this remains exactly untouched. The only thing you change is the dimensions of the grid. And this will be the exercise you'll be able to do. Rectilinear. So this is a different beast. As you can see, the spacing between grid points is, is diverse in each of the x, y, and z direction. The content of the request information here is, I was going to say unchanged, but that's not true. Well, at least this is the common part. What doesn't show here anymore is actually the spacing. Because in the case of rectilinear, we will have to specify explicitly an x axis and a y and a z. And that becomes, that is part of the uh, request information uh, part where we here, using NumPy, I give, I generate a set of, a set of axes between 0 and 1 of size dimensions of 0. And I set the x coordinate of my output explicitly with the axis. I do the same for y and for z. The structured grid is, the f is another type yet. So structured grid means curvilinear. Here I've used 1327 by 1 to make it a 2D grid. You're welcome to change that to make it become a 3D grid. And this will become a cylindrical grid. Here we have, I don't know what it's called, a, a slice through a cylinder. If you make it 3D, it becomes a cylinder. And you're welcome to change any of those numbers. And you'll see the data grow or shrink. And I set two different scalar arrays in the examples. I set the radius which goes from the center here outwards. And I set the theta angle, which is around the direction here, around the, uh, the polar direction. In the case of a structured grid, I have to s explicitly give 3D coordinates. So it's a full size x, y, z array. And I call it coordinates in that case. Now. In the case of the structured grid, the type VTK structured grid has a special field called, as a special method called set points. And this, of course, depends on the type of grid you are generating. If you use a VTK image data, that method does not exist. So you'll have to, when you build a different mesh type, you'll have to refer, go to the reference page on the, way, on the VTK website to see what are the methods used to build up your grid. So set points for curvilinear. Unstructured is a little bit more complex. So for unstructured here, I've taken the case of the same cube. So with the, the, the cube for the tutorial and I've I've uh, tessellated this cube into tetrahedra. Now a cube of size, I forgot, is it a three by three, becomes a set of 40 tetrahedra. 40 tetrahedra with 27 vertices. I have an explicit set of coordinates. So this is x, y, z for the first vertex, x, y, z for the second vertex, and so on. Obviously, the number of nodes is the shape of this x, y, z array divided by 3. Now, each of those tetrahedra here has four vertices, and I need to give explicit indices uh, in the standard ordering uh, given by the VTK textbook. So this, again, you need to refer to the, uh, to the documentation for that. And this is the syntax of the connectivity list. For each tetrahedra, I have four vertices. So I use the number four here, followed by the four indices. 
So for the first tetrahedra four, one, ten, and zero, all the indices start at zero. By the way, this makes up the first the first tetrahedra. Zero, four, three, twelve makes up the second tetrahedra, and so forth. Finally, I need to build a connectivity list. So that's the list here. Oh yeah, I just said that actually. It's a contiguous list of numbers of vertices, one integer, followed by the n indices. So take the case of an oh. hexahedra now. An hexahedra has eight vertices. So you would use the number eight followed by eight IDs. I had a case, interesting, uh, when I did some work uh, with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, where they were using the XDMF encoding. Perhaps you've used it yourself. XDMF is a layer that enables you to document the contents of an HDA5 file in something that is user-readable and that gives the size, dimensions of your grid, etc., etc. Unfortunately, for the case of unstructured grid, the ordering of the XDMF element, the convention of ordering, is upside down. To do the interface to VTK object, I had to manipulate lists of millions, hundreds of millions of elements reshuffle all the indices around. So be very careful with the file format you use. This is actually a lesson I, I teach all the time when I teach data interfaces to VTK. Watch out what your file format does for you, because you might incur into a very heavy cost to fit the VTK data model. <clears throat> Finally, we need a list of cell types. Here I have an, a simple examples where all the cells are tetrahedra. So it's very simple. Yet I have to give the, the type of element for each element in my list, which means I could do a finite element mesh of mixed types. In fact, that's exactly what I was doing with the Barcelona supercomputers where we had wedges, prisms, and, py and pyramid. In this case, in our case here, the tutorial, we only have tetrahedra, so I have to make an array with the, the code index for VTK tetra. And it's basically an, an empire array full of size, number of elements, and of type, unsigned, unsigned byte. There. And then I need a third array, which is an array of offset into the list of connectivity. Now, because I have tetrahedra with four indices, I have the number four plus four indices for each cell, so that makes five numbers into my list, which means that the first element is indexed at zero, the second element would be indexed starting at five, and so forth, right? In this case, we have tetrahedra, so five integers per element in my list. Well, I use some NumPy tricks to generate. I need a list which contains exactly this, 0, 5, 10, 15, etc., all the way to the number of elements I have. I use some NumPy tricks to set up a range, an array of range n elements, which, which would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I multiply by 5. And automatically, I get 0, 5, 10, 15. OK, that list of offsets, the list of cell types, and the list of connectivity are the three arrays we need to build up an unstructured mesh. And I'm going to set it here in one line command output. In this case, the name output refers to the unstructured grid. And I say set cell 
given the array cell types, the cell offsets, and the connectivity. And I'm done. This one command sets up the full connectivity of the grid. The coordinates doesn't change. It's just like the curvy linear grid case. I set up my points away to be the x, y, z coordinates. Perfect. So demonstrations, I have some of those. I have already demonstrated the PV image data. Now we have uh, <clears throat> 25 minutes for you with the virtual machine, module load para view, go to the mesh builder subdirectory and exercise each of those examples. And you run them, you run them exactly like this, para view, minus minus script equals, no spaces here, the file name. So image data, rectilinear and structure. And we have a fourth example, which I haven't talked about yet. It's the multi-block example where I've decided because this is, this, kind of, this is going to fit the exercise of tomorrow where we do a grid partition with four, in four different ways. And we have to make four different VTK image data and we have to insert them into a so-called multi-block object. So I've made up the example here. It's called PV multi-block zero. It creates a container. That's what the multi-block data set is. It's a container of other more, the primitive grid types. There, so on your keyboards, go ahead and play with those. You have several things to try out. Change the dimensions of the grid. And then if you want to see the parallelism working out, change the MPI settings for your, for your Paraview server, apply, quit, relaunch, and then you get a parallel PV server running. And you'll get all of those scripts being executed in parallel. And um, we are here to help you do the, man, the manipulations and understand the, uh, the syntax. All right. Basically, uh, the simplest one is, of course, the image data, where this is the fundamental commands are there set. You are, of course, welcome to change spacing, origin, and, and you see immediately what happens to your, to your grid. Because as you apply, you're going to see your grid shrink or being displaced in space as you, as you play with it. OK? So we'll do the exercise. I think we can probably stop the video there. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is that, you know, we've been talking a lot about this extent-based model. So there, there's two different ways that parallel, uh, pair of you can do parallel domain decompos decompositions. One is the extent-based, which we've been looking at a lot here. The other one is called piece-based. And so instead of in the request information pass, instead of telling pair of you that you have this big extent that you want to want it to carve up, you tell it, okay, I have this many pieces. So that could come into play when you have like an AMR data set, where each MPI rank in your simulation is going to have many um, patches or blocks of data. Um, so when you start Paraview, the reader will tell Paraview, okay, I have a thousand pieces. Paraview is going to say, okay, I'm running on a hundred nodes. How do I divide that a thousand pieces? Then when it executes, it's going to make a request for you know, some range of pieces of each process. And so that's the other way. And that's how unstructured meshes get decomposed. And multi-block data sets get decomposed. 
Yeah. So that's the only thing I would add to that. That's a very good uh, comment. Yeah. In fact, if you recall, the exercise VTK image data 3.5, this was the example where we said set number of pieces 4 and set piece 0, 1, 2, 3. This was an example of a piece based partitioning instead of an extent based. Very good. Mm -hmm. Great. So, can you guys uh, mind to uh, read those examples? Yeah? Okay. So, we have a parallel of the water and the ice as well. Uh, we don't see the settings at uh, all. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. There is yes. an advanced setting <laughs> button. Let me put it up on the screen. Settings and the edit settings. Many in many places in Paraview, you're going to see here where my mouse point is a little wheel icon, and this opens up the full dialogue of properties. So because there are so many options, you oftentimes by default Paraview starts with a reduced set of uh, GUI widgets which are being exposed. If you if you click on that, that will open up the full menu. You browse down a little bit and you'll find the MPI menu and then put down uh, down the time. There we go. Auto enable auto MPI and you set it to two and three. Those are good examples. Unless you only have two cores on your laptop, <laughs> then don't set three. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because there are many cores you can make available for the intro box. Yeah. Slices are available. The one we have before the key. You mean the PDF? Yeah. Yes, of course, it will be. Uh, we haven't packed it yet, but it will be available and we'll make it in. We should try to do this maybe tonight. I mean, the, the notes are pretty much settled, you know? The, the slide deck, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, they're done. There's a PDF on this you drive. Maybe last night. Yeah, there's a PDF file on this drive okay. if, if you want it. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, the, the PowerPoint you. version is on there as well. I just didn't know if people all have, people have PowerPoint. What is the difference between the two different panels with a script? It's called request for request information and then script. The request information, which is the, the part below it, is the first pass of the paradigm. It's where you advertise the, the grid type you want to generate. And then the part above is the, the so-called third pass. The execute part, this is what the, the heavy duty computing takes place. The, the real data generation takes place. Those are the differences. Okay? We can always cut no. it up later. Sure. Yes, sure. Um, now, you know, since I do the exercise of interfacing Paraview to many custom file formats here for users at CSCS, this is very often how I start. I start with one of those uh, skeletons of the, uh, the, uh, the grid, the, the mesh builders, and then I... I put in the code that I know will understand the file format of the, of the users. And that's really, so it's really something I use uh, quite often, that particular way of prototyping the reader. Especially for all those codes, people are giving me outputs written in HDF5. 
Those are fantastic. I use H5Pi, and I can read, and I can do sub array get, you know, in H5Pi. This is fantastic. And I, and I can support exactly the, the, the data partitioning using H5Pi. Blank screen, yeah. Oh, that's fine. Okay, okay, yeah. good, okay. Okay, okay, yes, cool. you're welcome. thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay, here you're running on three processors, eh? I can, I can tell. <laughs> I've done this so many times that I almost know the images uh, by heart, yeah. Uh, is there a problem? Yeah, uh, Ooh. Ah, it's perhaps PV server. Aha, uh -huh. fail to automatically launch PV server. Wait, but is this, this is on your own, uh, is this the virtual box or? Yeah. Ah, does that mean? Well, maybe it's between Box yeah, which yeah, it's, it can only be no because he, he, can, he can he's getting errors in the, on launching the MPI the parallel version, and this I can only unless there is a conflict of modules, a conflict of libraries. Hmm. Alessandro, so, uh, Emacs. Ah, ah, cool. uh, uh, I am uh, okay. guessing uh, that the the the. The this. environment yeah. is messed up. I didn't want to take um, so uh, okay. uh, in Emacs, I don't know. Did you try it from the command line? Yeah, try from the command line just to see. And then if you have the problem, because Jean just ran it that way, you know, on the same virtual machine. So, but you know, so if it works in the command line then yeah, it's an environment problem in Emacs, and then you'll just have to figure out how to give Emacs the environment variables that it needs. Can you do an MPI exec minus N2 hostname slash bin slash hostname? Well, he's me. running an Emacs inside of Emacs. So. Instead of Emacs? Oh no, what is, what is this? The output of the view. Well, this is in Emacs, right? Was it? I think so, because that's not. What's Emacs? Yeah, an yeah. editor. Just kidding. Okay. Just kidding. It's one that I don't so, use. It's one that I don't use. What is this use. mesh builder, right? It's the usual. Uh, I think I'm sorry. Mesh yeah, I ah. noticed that, and uh, this keyboard is different yeah. than mine. I don't know what the adapt oh. the. Okay. Adapter so, is. did you already load the module? Uh, oh, module actually. Module load, but you did in the other one. Yeah. Okay. So let's just see. So. Actually, you can use those programs. Uh, yes. Where is the dash key? Okay. Uh, script equal. Yeah, it's uh, because I don't. Okay, you, you, you do. And now, you do. Um, now do the script. Which whichever one. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the Macs don't work so well. Uh, I think a typo, maybe. So I think it's PV. Oh. 
Ooh. No, this is, let's uh, close this. Um, uh, we split this, maybe. How do I close? Ah, there. Mm -hmm. This, right? Yeah. Make a render view, and then make this visible. That must have been from something before, right? I don't know. Did you use the spreadsheet before? Do you know pair view very well? Uh, um, <coughs> yes. Surface. It's standard in pair view, yes. So, uh, it's the environment. It's the environment because it has to have the. If you it, I mean, use that module show based, command that John was um, referencing earlier, yeah. it will show exactly how the environment so has it's to be set actually up. Very, very there are many paths even outside yeah, of VTK. This, uh, uh, now VTK has right. it's not in the back profile. No, you have to type that command. Uh, so maybe in, in your space, Emacs, maybe you type module you load have, yeah, uh, inside of the, the Emacs terminal, and I then it will be have the right in my so that hand. means that may solve it. By heart, yeah. you the, the name of the class is... That's that always the problem with the environment. It has to be exactly right, and there's many, many things that have to be set. Available in VDK. Yep. By default, Paraview uses the KD3 partitioning, but you can also override that. There's a, ca a class called the VTK Extent Translator, I believe. <laughs> huh? Yeah, wow. You know, you know VTK very well. Thank you. I'm, in, I'm impressed. That yeah. is like a very, you know, and hidden class. That's what I use for, uh, I gave the example before, coffee. If I want Paraview to subdivide my grid only in one direction, I can force it. I use the VTK extend translator because I can say use X slab, Y slab, or Z slab. Yeah. So the examples are running. Yeah. Now somebody was asking me also, how do you go? So the Python code for VTK Python is different than the Python code for Paraview. Yes. There's no one-to-one. -one. It's not copy and paste. That it's not going to work. The reason is because Paraview uses so, the so-called proxy object as an interface between the uh, GUI client and the server side where the, the code is executed. So you don't actually have the same syntax. How do I do it? I usually prototype. So, Paraview is an end user application. If I can do everything with Paraview, I just do everything and I'm done. If, however, I need to use some functionality of, Par of VTK that is not visible, that is not yeah, available in Paraview, I will prototype my pipeline with Paraview. I will write the Paraview Python code. In any case, I never use state file, the so-called state files of Paraview, the so-called extensions .pvsm, because they're, they're very difficult to transport from one application to the next to reuse. I only, when I save the state of my Paraview sessions, I always use para Python. I prototype with Paraview, I save my Python script, and then from the Paraview Python script, I can rewrite the VTK Python, a script that is available for the VTK Python syntax. It's a little bit of an exercise. Uh, it takes practice. <laughs> it takes practice. But it gives me access to some other functionality that perhaps you don't have in Paraview. For those of you staying on Friday, uh, we will also see how to expose some functionality that you know exists in VTK, but you don't see it in the graphical user interface. Per there can be multiple reasons. There can be that it's just too difficult because of partitioning, because it needs ghost cells, ghost cells are not implemented, uh, for a variety of reasons, but there are actually quite a few things uh, that you can import. And some of it you do via XML code, some of it you do via Python code. 
some of it you do via plugins. There are multiple ways of importing uh, VTK algorithms and filters that are not available by default. We will have exercise and demonstration of this on Friday as well. Is everything going well? Oh, okay. It's because it's because you're missing the. Uh, <laughs> no, he has that on his screensaver. <laughs> his desktop. <laughs> Watch out! out. So, are, do you think it's your oh, your disk is full? Perhaps that ah. I'm worried about that. I, I hope it's not. So it's it's noon now. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna. I was gonna say, it's twelve o'clock in three minutes. We're gonna stop. They have some cold. Uh, I'm sorry. They have some hot food being uh, just delivered here to the uh, to the uh, uh, entrance. So you're welcome to stop. And if you're done, if you feel comfortable with the uh, demonstration, your exercise, uh, you're welcome to stop. And then we will restart officially at one o'clock this afternoon. Okay. Good. I've plugged in the power here. I think this is the oh, right. The power fell out. Uh, I was getting a. Yeah. yeah, good patch. Yeah. Yep. It's charging now. Um, yeah. Have you done that part already? Yes. Okay, you don't have to do that again. That was just a one th one time thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Any changes you make on the virtual machine? Yes. Yeah. Can I open a browser here? Sure. Um, to, let's see. To down show. Here. Yeah. There's Chrome and there's okay. uh, Safari. I'm going to show a motivational video, maybe, cool. if I can. FTP.csch slash out slash lots of stuff. OK, and now? Play, wait. This is just a motivational video to to talk about during lunchtime. Uh, this is one of the latest I've done in uh, in uh, November. Uh, here, this was done on Pete's Day uh, using a volume rendering of the temperature field of a large grid. And this, uh, this fuzzy rendering that you see called volume rendering, we, we will talk about it a lot during the Friday session. It uses the NVIDIA index library, which we will also discuss in great details on Friday. This is large grid, so it's all done in parallel, and it's all Python driven. And this is, Python is a life saver. <laughs> Put that in your mind. If you don't already know it, because to script things like this uh, can be uh, pretty painful if you don't have uh, the right thing. Now, how do I do uh, some big, big data like this? I do it with a small data set first. I prototype it on my desktop. And have you noticed that the Python code I've given you for the exercise, you didn't have to change a single line of code to make it run in parallel. 
It's because if you do it, if you do things right, the parallelism is implicit. The subdivision of the data and the multiple instances of the, par the pipelines is all done per view automatically. Whether you whether you run on the small data on one proc on your laptop, or whether you run on pits date with a thousand nodes or more, and the same will apply with some of the in situ techniques we use with Catalyst, for example. We will load a small data set representative of the big simulation. We will use Catalyst to write a Python script for that small representative data set, and then we will apply it at large scale on the, uh, on the big data. Okay, let's go to lunch if you guys are all, uh, all ready. So what is, is this like burning? Or? It's not burning, it's, uh, it's uh, well, it's the temperature field. Okay. But it's basically a cold fluid and a small fluid mixing. So gases, okay, mixing. That was a difficulty, and we will also talk about this on Friday. I'm doing a lot of publicity for Friday. You should, you should come on Friday. Uh, this was a rectilinear grid, which is not directly available for volume rendering, so I had to apply some tricks. And those are the tricks we'll see uh, yeah, so, um, on Friday. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting, because like Paraview, it doesn't, it doesn't volume render rectilinear mm -hmm. grids, even though yep. DK has a capability yep. of doing yep. that. Yep. So you convert to yep. an image? I can, for that case, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, I converted to image. Unstructured, this is beyond the topic now. It's, it's already lunchtime okay. uh, talk. Uh, unstructured grid with VTK or Paraview is uh, difficult to do. Fortunately, the NVIDIA Index plugin now does it beautifully. I've done a case with 800 million unstructured cells here at CSCS on a small number of nodes, I think 64, and it worked really, really well. I'll, I'll show you this on Friday. Okay, let's go to lunch. <laughs>